HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Southern Farm and Garden, a beautiful handcrafted agricultural journal. Purchase a copy today at southernfarmandgarden.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello, this is Lisa Held coming to you live from Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and you're listening to The Farm Report, a Heritage Radio Network show about the people, processes, and policies that shape how food is produced today. So today we're going to be diving into grass-fed beef with a true leader in the field, Ridge Shin. Ridge, thank you so much for coming all the way from central Massachusetts to be here. Thank you. It's quite an opportunity. <laughs> so um, I think we should just start really at the beginning. Um, you have been doing this for a very long time, um, and I'd love to just hear a little bit about your background as a farmer. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Uh, sure. We don't, we don't want to take up the whole time, but I, <laughs> I, I tell people that I learned to farm in the 1800s because I learned to farm at a museum, which was trying to replicate the 1830s. So we milked the cows by hand, we used oxen, we mowed the hay with a scythe. So that's oh kind of where I started. At the same time, I worked on a modern dairy farm, milking about 125 head. This is many years ago. And then over the years, I've kind of segued. For the last 20 years, I've been involved in grass-fed beef. So I kind of stumbled upon it, uh, learned about it, and for about 20 years in various different companies, been working on 100% grass-fed beef. Got it. And you're not actively farming right now, are you? No. I actually am busy with the business and don't actually have cattle on my farm. Okay. Like, yeah. Do you miss it? I do. And my <laughs> grandson keeps lobbying for it. It's like, but I got to travel. I got to go talk to farmers. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't be here. Um, so, <clears throat> so your company, Big Picture Beef, um, is focused on doing raising uh, cattle in a very specific way. Um, what, what is that way? What is your system for um, grass-fed beef look like? Well, it's really pretty simple. It's uh, 100% grass-fed beef, but it's also high-quality, consistent high-quality grass-fed beef. One of the issues with grass-fed beef, a lot of grass-fed beef, people just quit feeding grain and don't do anything else, and a lot of the grass-fed beef that's out there is not very good to eating experience. So we, our system promotes um, finishing the cattle, making them fat on a grass-only diet. So it's not rocket science, but it is quite a skill set to do that. Well, how do you do that? What's the, the difference in the system that um, makes the uh, cattle fatter? <laughs> well, one of the challenges is that the, um, the cattle, when they're being finished, have to have access to the energy in the grass. So the grass is uh, the grass has to be tall. The top third of the plant is energy. The cattle have to move through that energy constantly. So we move cattle maybe four times a day on our finishing farms. So the cattle grow on a cow-calf farm, and 
they don't have to move that often. They just eat grass. The, ca- the mother cow provides the milk. The calves grow up to about a year of age. But then we move the cattle to our finishing farm where we have a bigger herd, and they move like a herd of buffalo, move constantly, and, and are able to eat the energy in the grass, which makes them fat. So are a lot of people who are doing grass-fed then not moving the animals enough? Absolutely. If you go to a lot of grass-fed beef websites, this is one of my big bugaboos, and you look at the best picture they put on the website, it looks like the cattle are standing on a golf course. (laughs) There's no grass. Right. If there's no grass, there's no energy. So you can finish them. It takes a long time. It's very inefficient. And But most people are harvesting cattle that are not fat. You know, they haven't been fattened on right. grass. So the eating experience reflects that. You have gamey taste, off flavors, you know, tough, you know. So um, that's kind of the history, but we've figured out how to do consistently high quality grass fed beef. Right. It's a big difference. And is it the same system as um, some of the other programs that are talked a lot about today? Um, for instance, I think right now there's a lot of attention to this um, idea of regenerative organic agriculture that incorporates like grazing with um, other crops and regenerates soil. And then also I know like Alan Savory and the Savory Institute is a huge proponent of grass-fed <coughs> beef. Um, are you doing something different or is it sort of this No, it, it's, uh, it, we, we incorporate a lot of their practices. It, it, actually, I'm doing a conference with Alan Savory on Friday in New Hampshire, it's called, uh, it, it, they've created what they call Savory Hubs. So there's groups around the country that teach their methodologies. So this is a new hub in New Hampshire at Stonewall Farms. And Friday, there's going to be a conference there, kind of kick off that hub. And we're going to be there. Uh, so we use those planned grazing concepts. But the other things we have to do is get the right genetics on the cattle. Mm. So we have to pick the right kind of cattle. And then the management really is, we want to plan the grazing, but we want to plan the grazing with enough energy in the grass to get fat. Right. So, so we, we do the same kinds of things that they do in terms of building the carbon storage in the ground, mm. but we do it kind of with an economic interest that we want a good piece of beef at the end of the day. Right. You know, that's, that's our, our goal. Yeah. And so you, you just mentioned the um, carbon sequestration. Can you talk a little bit about that um, as a component of what you do? Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest. It's uh, a, yeah. yeah. The, the carbon is a huge. Uh, we actually just uh, were announcing on Friday a collaboration with an environmental group, Soil for Climate. Uh, and we're, you know, it's an environmental group paired with a meat company. Some, something kind of unheard of, but we agree <laughs> on carbon. And we're calling it the Northeast Drawdown. So what we found is that grazing enables us to take carbon out of the air and sequester it below the soil. So the grazing doesn't, but the plant does. So the technique we use is something that every kid in in grade school biology has learned about, photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So photosynthesis takes CO2 out of the air and takes that, makes it into sugars, and stores it below the soil in a stable form. Now, once the carbon is down there, the carbon exudates go out, and they they help the microbiology, the bacteria, and everything break down the minerals, the nutrients, make them plant available, which comes back into our into our plant for our cattle. So that's the reason we're interested. But the, but the corollary is that we're sequestering tremendous amounts of carbon mm. by this process. And the research now, the peer-reviewed research is fully on board. Uh, Richard Teague from Texas A&M has been doing this research around the country and finds this significant measurable amounts of carbon sequestered by this adaptive multi-paddock grazing, the way we graze the cattle. Mm. like the uh, and, and so the... The, the second part of that is if we get the carbon back in the soil, then it holds water. Mm. So, so we have, I mean, at the end of the day, water is a big problem for society. And what happens, um, you know, if you go on our website, you'll see there's a perk test or a infiltration test of, of different management. So corn land extensively grazed land, the way most cattle are grazed out west and the way the grass-fed cattle are grazed in Australia, just put the cattle out and they just wander around and eat everything, and then this adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is that when you do this infiltration test on the corn land, it takes 30 minutes for the water to infiltrate. 
So you wonder why the Mississippi floods. The, right. the water can't go into the ground. It's like concrete. Yeah. And then on the extensively grazed land, it's dramatically better. It's about seven minutes for the water to percolate or to infiltrate. Now you switch to the adaptive multi-paddock grazing, 10 seconds for the wow. water to infiltrate. So, and once the water goes into the soil, the carbon grabs it. Hmm. The carbon's like a sponge. So, so when you begin to think of how this could impact watersheds, states, you know, yeah. the whole country, it's, it's a massive potential um, to get the carbon out of the air. It's, it's like the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. You know, we don't need some machine to pull it out of the air and store it. We have photosynthesis, which works. Yeah. <laughs> it's been working since forever. We have to optimize it. <laughs> and this grazing system optimizes it. Right. Well, and I think, I don't think anybody would argue at this point that um, grass fed beef is not better for the environment than grain finished, right? Like, that's, I, I think it's, m people are more aware that it is a lot better for uh, the environment. I think one, one criticism you hear a lot when you talk about this is, um, how would there be, ever be enough land to do this? Um, how do you respond to that? Oh, the, uh, I, I could point you to articles that show that there's a tremendous amount of land. One of the things that's fascinating, when we do this, we find that we can actually increase the biomass production on a piece of land threefold. What, what do you mean by biomass production? Well, the amount of grass. Okay. So in other words, uh, on the land trust that I leased for years, when I started, it had been in corn for 25 years, sprayed with all kinds of poisons. We planted uh, some perennials, and we started grazing. It didn't grow very well. By the third year, we began, we, we had grass that was about four feet tall. Mm. And when the grass is four feet tall, the roots are four feet deep. Mm. And when we actually measure that grass, we measure the amount of biomass, the amount of acre inches of grass, it's just stunning that in three years we can go from very little biomass produced to a tremendous amount. So and that, you know, that means that's food. Right. And so it, what you're saying is that you don't need as much land if you have more grass. Is Precisely. That <laughs> okay. Precisely. So in other words, you triple the amount of your land huh. on that one piece of land by grazing. Right. I mean, it's counterintuitive, but it's, we've done it all over. You know, one of my finishing farmers in Vermont, Mark Cesario, has, has measured the carbon. And, and when I go up and visit him and walk through the grass, I can hardly walk. The grass is so thick. Mm. And it's just been created by cattle grazing. Yeah. No, no inputs, you know, no, no fertilizers, no tractors, no lime, no, just the cattle grazing. Right. And you were saying earlier that um, <coughs> the, um, the land on the East Coast in New England is actually uniquely good for this. Can you Absolutely. talk about that a little? Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what, what's fascinating is that out West, where most of the cattle are grazed in an extensive fashion, it takes about 15 to 20 acres to support a cow annually. In the Northeast, it takes about an acre to support a cow. The difference is rain. Right. You know, when, they, when we have a bad year and a, and a droughty year in the Northeast, we only get 20 inches of rain. Out there, they never get more than 12 inches of rain. Mm. So we have tremendous advantage of rain. We have dairy-quality soils. We also have proximity to the market, which right. is huge. But the, um, the advantage in, in an, envi an environment where we have plenty of water and manage the cattle, we can, we can just make this happen rapidly. Right. Well, what about, um, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, so what about um, how the actual system works when it comes to big picture beef um, working with farms? I want to dive into um, how you're approaching farms, who you're working with. I think you have sort of like an aggregation model. Can you talk a little Correct. bit about that? Yeah, so... Uh, so um, the statistics are that in the Northeast, which we describe as New England, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, West Virginia, there's over 600,000 beef calves born every year. Not dairy calves, just beef. The vast majority of those calves go west to the feedlot. So basically what we want to do is get in the middle of that relationship. So when the calves are a year old, instead of getting on a truck and going west, we want them to come into our aggregation system and go to grass finishing instead of grain finishing. So we're working with the typical small farm is 20 head of cattle. Okay. That's national average. So you have all these little cow-calf producers, 
And currently, they, the cattle dealers aggregate them and send them west. So we stepped into that relationship. So we're aggregating for about 70 farms right now, and it's beginning to grow. We're beginning to recruit farmers into that. And what are the farmers that you're recruiting? What were they generally doing before? Well, just selling to the conventional market. So we pay, the way it works is we pay about 15, 20% above the market. So in other words, if they took their cattle to the auction or the cattle dealer, they'd make thus, we, we pay more. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a philosophy that um, everybody in the food chain has to eat. And if everybody eats, then we have a sustainable business. And so in other words, the microbes have to eat the grass, the cattle, the farmer, the cow-calf farmer, we do, the producer, the consumer, everybody in the system. And, and uh, so that's our, you know, the, the farmers are very interested to make 15, 20% above commodity price. Right. Yeah. Has there been, I mean, that kind of seems like a no brainer. Have you gotten any pushback from farmers? None. They're <laughs> desperate. They're desperate to find a way out. And, and what's fascinating is a lot of the farmers that are joining up are farmers that have tried the farmer's market scenario hmm. where they have a big freezer and they go to the farmer's market on Saturday and then they come back and they put all their inventory away and they have to do their marketing and they have to take care of their inventory and all this kind of thing. Those, a lot of those people are joining up. They're saying, hey, this is a lot of work for the amount of money. We're mm-hmm. really not getting making a whole lot of money. And it's somewhat limited scenario. So th- if they raise cows and calves for us and then they sell us the calves, they have room for a bunch more cows and calves. Mm. So they can, and they can do that in kind of a part-time fashion right. efficiently. And we can help them get the right genetics, use the right bull, we can help them in management. We can help them figure out how to quit feeding hay, which is the key to their success financially. Mm. If they want to listen, we can we can teach them about okay. that. So and then so you handle like the next steps in the process, like big picture beef handles then like the slaughter processing exactly. all of that. We have the finishing farms where we actually finish the cattle and then we harvest the beef. We process at three different plants, put it in the packages, and then we do the logistics to the market. Mm. Um, yeah. You know what? I actually, I want to pause for a second. Um, we kind of, I, I dove right into this, like, hey, let's talk about the, the way this works. And um, now that we're kind of in it, it makes me think there might be people who need a little more context for just how, like when we talk about <coughs> raising cattle and then you say then finishing, right? There's like right. two different steps in this process. Can we just like step back a second and can you just explain that to someone who maybe has no idea how this works like what's the difference between the finishing process yeah absolutely so uh, many people have heard of feedlots and CAFOs and all the bad stuff that goes with that and that's a true story (laughs) beef is problematic when you uh, concentrate the animals that's 97 percent of the cattle in the country are raised on a cow-calf farms these same farms that we're dealing with and eat only grass for the first at least year of their life. Right. And then uh, a lot of them then go to the feedlot and for the last 120 days get feed fed grain to make them fat. And <clears throat> the grain is problematic because it's grown with um, herbicides, pesticides, glyphosate, um, GMOs, on and on and on. Mm-hmm. And then when you put all these animals together in one place, you have this incredible concentration of manure, which goes to a lagoon. You probably heard about the lagoons in, in North Carolina being flooded out. Yeah, with the hurricane. So you get this tremendous concentration of nutrients, which, you know, manure is a good thing. You go to the store, you buy a bag of manure. Mm-hmm. But if you have too much in one place and no way to get it back on the land, you have a problem. So that's what happens in the feedlot scenario. So there's many companies now that pull their punches and say, well, we're grass-fed. Everybody wants to be grass-fed, except that we finish on grain. Mm. But what happens is when you finish on grain, when you feed grain, we have a little motto, feed grain, kill soil. So grain is grown typically with GMOs, glyphosates, poisons, herbicides. And um, so when you feed that grain, you change the whole structure of the meat. You change the fats in the meat. You change. and, And at the same time, if you look at it, if you zoom out, you're killing some soil somewhere to grow that grain that gets fed to your grass-fed, a little bit of grain scenario. Right. So um, <clears throat> we, we are pretty strict about it. We, um, we feel it's got to be 100% grass-fed. And what we tell people, it's kind of like pregnancy. You know, <laughs> you can't be kind of 
sort of almost pregnant. <laughs> you're, you're either pregnant or you're not. Right. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're either grass-fed or you're not. You're either grass-fed or you're not. And, and so many people pull their punches because it's easier with grain mm. to make them fat. And people say, oh, well, we're grass-fed. Oh, a little bit of grain finish. Mm. Everybody kind of, you know, uh, downplays that. But we feel it's real important. And the other thing that's fascinating is when you look at the actual science, we work with this uh, scientist, Susan Duckett, at Clemson University. And what she does is takes a piece of meat, precipitates all the fat out, and she can look at the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids mm. and determine whether it ate grain or not. Wow. She said that's like a fingerprint. So in the... 100% grass-fed beef, the omega-3 levels are higher and the omega-6 are lower. Well, what's interesting is a lot of people, and a lot of people get off and say, well, the omega-6 is bad fat and the omega-3 is good fat. They're both essential fatty acids. They're both essential for brain function. Right. But the human body needs them in the right ratio. ratio. Mm. So when you feed grain, you have 10 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. When you feed just grass, you get like 1.2 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. So it's the ratio. Hmm. And, and if you get the ratio right, then, then you want more of these fats. Mm. That's our whole philosophy is that you want more fat. Right. And, but it's got to be the right kind of fat in yeah. the right ratio. And that's, that's the, uh, again, it's, it's very hard for the consumer because it's not black and white. It's kind of, it's shaded. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you have to dig in to understand it. But, but it's absolutely true when you feed grain, the grain is what creates all the bad wrap that red meat has for your health. Yeah. The heart disease, on and on and on. That's because of the omega-6 fatty acids, which comes from the grain. Well, not, you know, not to mention the E. coli and, I mean, there's mad cow. There's all these other attributes that come from grain. Yeah. And, I mean, nutrition research is certainly moving forward in a way that is uh, in line with that. I feel like in the past five years, maybe 10 years, there's just been so much attention to this idea of you need fat, right? You Absolutely. need, you need help. Absolutely. Fat it has is, to be the right kind. It's but, the, exactly. Yeah. It's the right kind. And see, the grass fed has it. So we have all the no's. We have no antibiotics, no added hormones, no E. coli, no mad cow, no, no, no. <laughs> we have all the no's. Yeah. But on the other side, we have all the pluses. We have the right fat ratio. We have high vitamin content. We're sequestering carbon. We're fixing the water cycle. We're creating rural jobs. Mm. You know, this is the one that we, where we really differentiate from the foreign product that's in the marketplace. Mm. You know, I'll give you a quick take on it. There's $100 billion worth of beef consumed in this country. There's about $4 billion of grass-fed beef. Of that $4 billion, $3 billion comes from elsewhere, right. Uruguay and Australia. So there's only 1% of grass-fed beef that's coming from this country. But... What happens with some of those, a lot of people say, well, how do you differentiate from the Australian beef? Well, for one thing, they're not here. They can't sequester carbon and fix the water cycle or create jobs in our environment. But the big problem is that the cattle are raised there in a very extensive, I mean, the cattle just wander around in kind of the worst management scenario. Yes, they never had any grain, but they didn't do anything good for the land. Mm. And that's the Australian grass-fed beef that's in our marketplace. It also doesn't taste very good. <laughs> You know, on and on, but it's it's a it's a totally different management system. Why why is it a totally different system? Is that just um, like well, a different? Well, it's similar to the system that's used typically in the West for cattle. So you have a big big area of land. You put the cattle out. Okay, so what happens when you do that is every time a plant grows, the cattle go over and nip it off. Okay. Okay, so for our adaptive multi paddock grazing, when we can find the animals to one area. And have them eat. The other grass is allowed to rest and grow. And then we move. And that land that we were just on rests. Mm. It's kind of like the buffalo. You have to go back and think of the model as the buffalo. You have this massive herd. You know, 50,000 animals moving. Well, you can imagine once they go through, the grass is trampled. You are in a manure and nothing to eat. So mm. they move. So we're, we're, we're replicating that methodology. Whereas in Australia... A lot of times they just have this, this wide open land and the cattle are out there. They wander around and eat, but it's not good for the land. Just in the same way that most of the Western grass management is terrible. Right. You know, most of the cattle that are raised out West on a BLM land or something like that, it's just terrible for the land. They're not doing this adaptive multi paddock grazing. You mean even grass fed, grass finished farms? Yeah. Well, yeah. not grass fed, grass finished farms. 
most of them have had to adopt some sort of management, but there are a lot of grass-fed farms that are not doing a great job. And you can, you can find the result in their meat, hmm. the taste, the flavor. Right. You know. I got to taste some of this big picture beef meat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so I want to, I really want to talk more about um, the foreign imports and then also dive into a little bit more about the market and consumer demand. Um, before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and hear from a sponsor and then we'll come back and get more into uh, consumer demand. Don't go in for understanding when you are away. Can't use my heart to think away the time. This episode is brought to you by Southern Farm and Garden, a beautiful handcrafted agricultural journal. Each issue features stories about food history, seasonal recipes, artisanal products, and the amazing people who bring it to your table. Packed with stunning photography, the content is fresh and educational. Southern Farm and Garden takes you behind the scenes to meet farmers, gardeners, wineries, chefs, and artists who are passionate about creating healthy, unique, and sustainable food and products that you can enjoy all year. Are you interested in eating healthier and learning more about where your food comes from and living a more connected life? Purchase a copy today at southernfarmandgarden.com. Foodtank.com named Southern Farm and Garden one of the top 20 magazines for people who eat, cook, and grow, praising it for connecting readers with the food, the farms, and the stories behind our food system. Subscribe today or find a retailer near you at southernfarmandgarden.com. All right, we're back. This is Lisa Held. You're listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio. I'm here with Rid Shin, and we've been talking all about grass-fed beef. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the market. So um, a little bit of background for listeners. Uh, we used to have a law um, called Country of Origin Labeling, uh, COOL. <laughs> it's a fun acronym. Um, that applied to beef, but it was repealed in 2005, um, and I just saw that the Organization for Competitive Markets and the American Grassfed Association filed a petition with the USDA this summer uh, to bring it back. So um, there was a press release that actually just went out this week, uh, which I wanted to bring up since I was talking to you, yeah. um, where they basically said, you know, there was so much interest from stakeholders in the industry that the USDA actually extended the comment period. Um, and that period just ended this past Monday. Um, so... Basically, it was like everyone in the industry was saying, we need to get this law back, right? We need to know right. where um, where the meat is coming from. Um, have you been involved in those efforts at all? Oh, yeah, a little bit in the comments. But, it, but it, what's hard is the customer really needs to get educated. So what what happens now is you can bring a whole container of beef from Uruguay. You can land it in the Port of Boss and say a whole container of grass-fed ground beef uh, trim. And then you can take it off the boat, take it to a processing plant in, say, Sutton, Massachusetts, grind it up, cut it up, package it, and then you can write on it, product of the USA. Right. So that it's it's infuriating for those of us that are trying to do it here because it's really not the product of the USA. It's ground and packaged in the USA. And that's the law. So the customer really needs to sort out, go into the store and say, hey, where did this come from? Because well, and there's really no way for them to know at the end of the day. No, yeah, there's not, and that and that's a problem because the the if if you want to support, um, you know, 100 percent local grass fed beef, you it's really a job. You have to go into your your um, vendor, go into your store, bang on the counter, go into the butcher shop, say, hey, I want local 100 percent grass fed beef. It's very disturbing because you know you have products like like one example, Dakota organic grass finished beef. Where does it come from? Australia. <laughs> it's called Dakota. Of course. Right. And, and you think, and another thing, a lot of people say, well, I buy bison. I buy buffalo. Mm. You know, well, 97% of the buffalo are finished on grain. Hmm. Now, you wouldn't think that. But right. But there's the reality. And, and so it's very hard to sort out. And yet the only hope I have is that the consumers will do the hard work to figure it out. You know, I mean, the, the quote that I love is... Uh, uh, Wendell Berries, he says, eating is an agricultural act. Absolutely. And it's absolutely true, you know, because 
those dollars that get spent here in New York City reverberate through the rural economy. Yeah. And the potential is just massive when you look at the markets. What the market shift could do if the market got educated and said, no, we want local, 100% northeast raised grass-fed beef. Right. And I, I want to talk more about that, the demand um, issue. But um, just to quickly wrap up this um, policy issue, I mean, I think, you know, consumers are important, but also um, there's this idea that the government needs to be regulating um, our food in a way that allows us to know what we're eating, right? And so hopefully this, in, in addition to consumer demand, right, right. hopefully <clears throat> the, the policy will change. Um, and I mean, I guess we, we don't know what's going to happen, but the fact that the comment period was extended and there was so much interest um, suggests <laughs> that... It's, it's hopeful. It's, I, I, yeah. I, I, just to state my case, I, I'm fairly jaded that policy can save us. Yeah. <laughs> it can't happen fast enough. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, you've heard of pink slime. Of course. Okay, so when pink slime is where they, they, pull, they use ammonia to pull all the red meat off the bones, and they put it in the school lunch program. Mm -hmm. So now if I'd send a lobbyist to work on that to Washington with a lot of money, I probably wouldn't have budged the needle. Bettina Siegel, one mother, found out about that. In three weeks, she put the USDA on the mat. Yeah. Because everybody said, no, don't put that in the school lunch. So I, I just think the power of the consumer is, could trump policy. I mean, the policy is going to take a while. Right. You know? And, and it just call me jaded, but it would be good if we do that. Yeah. And it would be great if we shift to USDA. But when you look at now... You know, the, the subsidies are for corn and soy, for, guess what, for animal feed, for ethanol, mm -hmm. which really is a non-starter. And yet, when the, the ethanol is subsidized by the government, and then the government forces us to buy it in our gas tank, and meanwhile, we're killing soil, and the farmers aren't making any money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a, <laughs> but that's a big, big policy. Right. It's not going to change rapidly. Whereas the consumers could... Turn this thing on a dime. But but so if I'm a consumer right now and I go to my grocery store tomorrow and I and I say, okay, well, I'm going to vote with my dollars. I'm going to buy grass-fed beef from the U.S., you know, uh, raised locally. And I go to the, the aisle where that meat is supposed to be and I don't even know which of it came from here. Or So I guess my question is there isn't – there might not be that option at the grocery store. So then what does the consumer do? Just have to, you have to <laughs> insist. You know, what, what, what's fascinating is, I mean, Walnut, Walmart has organic grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. Why? Not because they think it's a good thing. Right. They have it because consumers said, we want this product. Yeah. And, and you just have to be insistent. And, and believe me, these, these groups, these stores, grocery stores, the vendors listen. Right. Now, um... It's hard because you, you need to get educated about what you want. You know, you want a regenerative product, one that's, that's sequestering carbon, that's local, that's humane, you know, on and on and on. It's a big list. But to get educated, and there's many ways to do it. I mean, our website's got a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of information right now out there yeah. about this. And, and then be educated enough to talk to the butcher and say, no, I don't want this product from Australia. I want it to come from the Northeast. And they'll say, well, where can we get that? And then you can say, well, here's a company, here's a company, here's a company. I mean, there are a few companies out there that are doing it. Right. But it is, um, I mean, it's really, uh, it's a chicken and the egg. You know, I can't get a big production system going if I don't have any throughput. You can't go to the store and buy it unless I have the production system going. Yeah. So it's like, a, it's like uh, people have to commit. And hopefully enough consumers who really understand the, um, well, big picture, that's the name of our company, big <laughs> picture beef, because the fact is that, that that beef is a climate solution. Beef will put down carbon rapidly. It'll fix the water cycle, and it'll provide rural jobs. So it's like, you know, it's healing in all these ways if it comes from this area. Mm. What, the beef that you're producing um, via Big Picture Beef, where will you be selling that? Is that a retail product, as in in a grocery store? Are you selling to restaurants? Um, how does that work? 
Mainly grocery stores. You know, um, we, we sell to a chain of stores in New England, Big, big, um, big Y. There's 70 stores. We're okay. in all 70 stores. We sell through a distributor in the Northeast, Black River Produce. We're actually talking to the distributor in New York City right now who goes to a number of vendors right here in New York City, Union Market, uh-huh. uh, Adamanelli's, uh, places like that. Okay. So we're, we're in the, within three weeks, we're going to be in this New York City in the meat case. Right. And is that retail? Is that your focus or? Retail is our focus. We're, we work with some institutions like Smith College. We sell to Smith College. Okay. We sell to some institutions. The restaurants are not our target because the restaurants tend to use the middle meats. And there's only about 8 or 10% of middle meats on an animal. Mm. So it's hard to say, okay, here's all our fillets, you know. So the restaurants are not as much of a target as the retail stores. Our feeling is that rather than the farmer's market, if people are going to go to the store anyway, they're going to go to the farmer's market, then they're going to go to the store. If they could go to the store, walk down, and there's our meat, they could put that in their basket along with their other products. Right. <clears throat> and so the one issue with um, selling the meat at retail alongside these um, grass-fed beef products that are coming from uh, New Zealand, Australia, the the foreign imports. Um, uh, One issue that I think gets talked about is that they are often undercutting uh, American grass-fed beef, so it's cheaper. A little bit. It's not not a significant problem. Okay. Particularly as we get the engine going. You know, as we get three times the grass on each acre. So say we lease an acre for $25 an acre. If we get three times grass, our lease is only a third of that. Right. And the same thing with as soon as we get to a mid-level scale. So right now, it costs me $4 a mile to truck five animals. It costs me $4 a mile to truck 38 animals. Mm. So, so as we grow the business, the efficiencies come in. And the fact is that we're much closer to the market than Australia or Uruguay. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. But why, how, why would it be cheaper if it was coming from across well, world, container, it's pretty cheap to put a container on a boat and move it, mm. you know. But the reality is that we, if, as we get to, to a little bit more efficiencies of scale, we can, um, we can be very competitive on price right, right here in, this, in, the, in the U.S. Okay. And is the idea for a big picture that you um, <clears throat> will continue to add farms and increase production in the Northeast, or is the idea that you would expand across the country? Well, right now, the Northeast is plenty big enough to, to take on. Mm-hmm. But the model that we've developed is eminently expandable. You know, if we find, that's what somebody said to me, he said, well, what if you get a big demand? Well, we can just expand the model. It's the same model. You know, cow-calf farms, individual cow-calf farms, source-verified you know, we, we, we can tell you which farm the calves came from, moving to a finishing farm, and then going to, to uh, harvest. Mm. So the same model works, could work throughout the country. But yeah. right now we're focused on the Northeast. I mean, we have the markets of the world. We have the rain. We have lots, plenty of cattle. You know, once we, get, once we run through 600,000 cattle, then we begin to say, oh, we got to expand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Well, and we have... Um, Obviously, this the Northeast is such a um, incredible region for agriculture. Uh, you and I were talking before the show a little bit about the dairy industry and um, just sort of the decimation of rural right. um, communities in New York and Vermont and across the Northeast um, related to dairy. Have you been able to um, ha- transition any dairy farmers to raising cattle and is that a focus absolutely that's a that's a primary focus so the dairy farmers when uh the, at least the ones in new england that belong to agrimark the co-op that buys milk mm-hmm. when they get their milk check in february they also got a list of suicide prevention counselors mm-hmm. suicide is just massive in farmers much higher than returning vets it's a desperate situation these people are finding themselves in and what we we have, we have converted some dairy farmers successfully. Basically, you know, we can show them how to begin to make money on their same land using their tractor, planting a cover crop where they used to plant corn, get rid of the dairy cattle, and start raising beef on that land. That's one of our huge goals in the near future is to to try and throw a lifeline to those farmers because when you when you drive around the Northeast. 
you see all kinds of agricultural land that's growing up in Goldenrod. Yeah. You know, Central New York, Maine, Vermont. And, and all that land could be put into this grass-fed beef very easily. Yeah, I just saw a number um, yesterday about the number of dairy farms that were lost in the past year, um, and it was it was really staggering. It <laughs> I'm, is. I'm remembering now, but um, have you had any like examples yet of people who have made the, the change? Yeah, yeah, I got a guy right in West Brookfield. Uh, Jim Talvey is his name. He was a mainline dairy farmer, milking a few uh, about a hundred head, mm. and he came to me at this about three years ago, and. Um, he had lost his wife to cancer. He had a new girlfriend. He was, like, looking for options. I said, Jim, look at this. And I showed him some bulls. I gave him some books. And he came back to me, like, a week later. And, I, and he said, I read all those books. I said, great, Jim. I got a bunch more. He said, no. I visited your farmers. I'm in. I sold my dairy herd Wednesday. I bought a fence post pounder. I'm a grass farmer. Hmm. So his conversion was just like that. And I still go back to him three years later. He said it was the best decision I ever made yeah. in my life. And he said, and I, another thing I told him, I said, Jim, you have to plant your corn land down to, to grass. He said, oh, that's kind of crazy. I could grow corn and sell it to somebody else. I said, no, plant it down to grass. And he came to me a, a few weeks ago. He said, Rich, he said, that's my best grass. It's like, really, Jim? Your best land's producing your best grass? <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, that conversion, because... Because these farmers, they know they know their land. They know cattle. They have a tractor. You know, I mean, they they it's it's it'd be an easy shift. It's a big paradigm shift. But well, that's what I was gonna. Yeah, is there? There's got to be a learning curve, though. There is some yeah. learning curve, but nothing they can't. They they're much much easier to to bring on board than say a beginning farmer who doesn't know anything about cattle, doesn't know anything about ground, doesn't know anything about grass. Mm-hmm. You know, they they know quite a bit. They're gonna have to shift some things, but. If they're desperate, which they are, you know, it's a, it's a market. You right. Know. Um, so we're going to wrap up in a minute, but I know um, this idea of educating consumers is kind of your passion right now. Um, yeah. Is there anything um, before we wrap up uh, that you want to leave consumers with? In terms well, of- absolutely. I, I want to, I want, um, I'd like to suggest that consumers do their research, go talk to their vendors, if you know of anybody that wants to be have a conversation about this, I would really love to have that conversation. We're looking for people also to invest in our company, and we're looking for people who have a business background to participate in our company. You know, mm-hmm. we see our company growing uh, to be a significant force in this uh, business. But the consumers are the key. So if if people have questions, if they have someone, you know, some other platform where we can talk about it. I'd love to do that because the more I see it, the more telling the story clearly and having people understand it is kind of the whole game. I mean, we know the genetics, we know grass, we know how to get killed, but the real game is getting people to understand the paradigm. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. And where can people find you online? Big Picture Beef is our website. Perfect. BigPictureBeef.com. .com. All right. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe, rate, and share it. Tune in next Wednesday when we'll be talking to some representatives from the Crop Trust about their new Food Forever initiative to safeguard agricultural biodiversity. See you then. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey, it's Francis Lamb, host of The Splendid Table. Every week on our show, we talk about food and cooking 
and the meanings of food and cooking. We talk with the most interesting people in food about their techniques, their culture, and everything in between. Whether it's about how fried chicken took over the world or how Instagram changes the way people are actually eating. It's a food show where everyone is welcome. Come join us. You can listen to this splendid table wherever you get your podcasts.